This is WPEA 90.5 FM, Exeter, Big Red Radio. You're listening to School of Athens. I'm your co-host, Avik Wadifer. I am Carter Otis. And I'm Charlie Scales. And today we've got a special guest here with us, Holden oh, Koreshma. Tell us. Hello, I'm Holden Koreshma, as Charlie Scales just introduced me. So, Holden, tell, tell us a little about yourself, like your entire life story. Like, we've got an hour. <clears throat> so, I was born... On a semi-rainy day. All right, that's about all the time we have. Um, so, Charlie, why do we got Holden with us today? Yeah, what's well, what's so special? Like, so Holden is, uh, you know, I would say he's a very eclectic person. He knows a lot about a lot of things. Um, he's he's a he's a classic student. He's also a big fan of hockey. He knows a lot about hockey. Um, he uh, uh, he likes philosophy, and I guess that's why we brought him in here today. Um, and he knows a lot about Socrates himself, so I think I just want to, you know, introduce everybody to the man, the myth, the legend, Socrates, as well as, you know, the wisest individual I ever met, which is Holden Krishna. So, thank you. I thank you for your kind words, and I guess with that, you know, we should talk about, you know, the man who's defined by his wisdom, and the wisdom that he knows nothing. We should probably start talking about Socrates, both as a <laughs> historical figure and as his actual ideas. Yeah, sure. Let's go for it. You wanna you wanna bring us in? What's our what's our like time scope here? What are we looking at? Setting stuff like that. So we're looking at almost entirely just in Athens in the you know fourth century BC. You know, he ends up dying in three ninety nine BC, born you know around three sixty eight three sixty nine BC, um, and <clears throat> basically his entire life is spent mostly in Athens, except for when he's in military campaigns. And I think uh, just to get off a few ideas, just so we can get an idea of him historically, and rather importantly, I think to sort of take down his sort of divine status. I think he's often given as, you know, called the father in Western philosophy. Um, so he was just, you know, sort of educated in a typical way from like a typical family. But that was, of course, of Athens. So he was still pretty rich because Athens was a very rich city. You know, you know a, lot of, a lot of trade, a lot of <laughs> slavery. Um, uh, so he serves in the military. And then I think a lot of people forget this. He has a wife and kids. He has a pretty normal life for the first half. You know, he, he's just a military person, you know, and he does a little bit of philosophy, but he's living a normal life. And then, Sometime, sort of right after his campaign, he gets a famous omen, which we'll sort of talk about later. Um, and then he sort of, that's when he begins his life of philosophy. Um, I guess on a personal level, on a like, physical level. Uh, and I think this is one of those things, we'll get to a long thing, that uh, a lot of things about him were really played up by people who came after him. So, you know, early on they said he was pretty ugly looking. He had, you know, bulging eyes, a large belly, and a snub nose. But people really pushed on that, really pushing that sort of that fascination. I think all of us humans have, we even see today, you know, sort of with Mother Teresa uh, in sort of the modern history, how people really tried to upplay how, you know, quote unquote ugly she was to say well, she was so beautiful on the inside. It was a sort of similar thing with uh, Socrates. They tried to say, well, he's so ugly, he's so old, but that sort of, uh, you know, makes him different than the sophists and the other people around him who are, you know, these young, cool dudes, but just don't know anyone near as much as he does. So that's all for that. Lengthy introduction, but I think it's good to know so we are, who we're talking about before we really get into the philosopher's side of it. No worries. Absolutely. I mean, so in terms of how he's gone with uh, or his entry into the field of philosophy, is there any particular subject like he started off from, especially because he was, you know, eventually becoming such a important or I guess significant figure? Um, what do we got first up for Socrates? Um, so I think when he was a young kid, he did obviously a lot of geometry that was typical of a uh, you know Athenian uh, educator. But I guess he also had always sort of a contrarian nature to him. And this is one of those things that's hard to separate fact from fiction. And I think Socrates is one of the hardest people to do it. But, you know, they always say, like, you know, he was always as a kid. He was always questioning stuff. Sort of, you, you can't read that with anything other than sort of like the George Washington cutting down a cherry tree where no one would really know what he was like as a kid. No one really cared to write it down, but sort of, I guess it's something they said. Um, and this ends up with an oracle, basically, when he's returning from the Oracle of Delphi, returning from war, who comes up with the phrase. And in most cases, it's actually told to a friend of Socrates, not a Socrates himself. Basically, it goes along the lines of, Socrates is the wisest man. And him, being who he is, wants to prove it wrong, say, I'm not the <laughs> wisest man. And he also needs it to be proven wrong, because he famously has that quote that everyone knows, that I know nothing. And so he knows one thing is that he knows nothing. And so how can he be the wisest man? He doesn't know anything. That's got to be, the human civilization has to be doomed if the wisest person of all of us knows literally nothing. And so I think that sort of gets to his idea of then that plunges him into this future of just 
trying to ask everyone he talks to, harass everyone he talks to, to try to get them to say, what do you know? Because I need to prove there's someone out there wiser than I am. Got it. Well, I mean, so he's asking everyone, well, you brought up this quote, you know, the only thing that I know is that I know nothing, right? Um, does that make him wise? I think that gets to the whole uh, idea at the very, like, you know, that is what defines Socrates because so, it's so hard to say what Socratic philosophy is because he didn't write anything down. He was a very uh, non-materialistic person, right? So, so much of what we know about because we only have, you know, uh, we have a few sources about him, but the main one about any of his philosophy is from Plato. And it's basically impossible to tell. I mean, scholars spend so much time on this. Scholars far more over than I am, but there's so much dis- uh, you know, disagreement on there. It's that there's no agreement on what is Plato's philosophy that he puts through Socrates and what is Socrates' philosophy. Because Plato never once writes a dialogue with Plato as a character. Almost always Socrates is the main character. And there's basically no way that Socrates actually had all these beliefs because they oftentimes contradict each other. And because no one else for, says he says them. So it really just comes down to we need to say what is Plato and what is Socrates. But one of the things we do know is Socrates, sorry, that's sort of long winded, mm-hmm. is that, you know, this idea of Socratic ignorance, understanding that you have no understanding, yes, this was what made him wiser than everyone else. And because no one else did it. And that, I think you can imagine that just even from a human perspective, taking it out of this philosophical idea, if some, you know, random old guy in the street came up to you, said, you know, tell me what wisdom is, tell me what virtue is, and you sit here saying, well, virtue is this, and he's like, well, why is it this? You know, ask you so many questions leading you on and on, making you look like an idiot in front of a bunch of people looking around, sort of laughing at you, you're supposed to be this, you know, handsome young upstart politically, and, you know, this, this guy just made you look like an idiot in front of everybody. Of course you're going to be angry, and I think that made him get a lot of enemies, but I think it's because, you know, I think there was a lot of, you know, for lack of a better word, trolling in what he did. I think he did like to sort of anger people, uh, but I also think that he just thought there was no shame in ignorance because he also didn't know anything himself. And so I think it's kind of interesting that we talk about knowing a little bit. Um, is this epistemological knowing? Is this, like, what does he mean when he really says knowing? So he had a lot to say about epistemology, but I feel that that was almost, uh, it's, it's almost guided by what he thought about virtue. And this is, I think, what it comes down to with knowing is like, what it really, he was the first philosopher that a lot of people really talk about in the West. In the East, there's actually a whole lot of this before, but in the West, quote unquote, uh, to really talk about ethics as the main thing and talk about virtue and say, well, what is virtue? Because a lot of people had different ideas of virtue, you know, virtue in the social custom sense, you know, like, you know, your virtue is to, you know, run for political office or, you know, quote unquote, a lot of people believe that there was a woman's virtue was to like watch after the kids and stuff like that. There's different virtue, there's not a universal virtue. It's just like, stuff you do that we consider to be good. And his thing was like, no, there's like a universal virtue out there, and we'll sort of talk about this later with his epistemology as well. Um, and it is the only good thing in the world is this virtue. Material possessions are for nothing. You know, they don't matter at all. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, rich, powerful, if you have anything, and that's why he lived a very simple life. He apparently walked around barefoot, had only like one coat he used all year round, except really long, untrimmed beard we see a lot of. He lived a very simple life, um, I think a lot of that was because he didn't believe in any of these material goods and then didn't charge anyone for educating them. And he had this very sort of important belief that I think is sort of hard to, I guess, agree with. But his idea is that virtue is the only good, which I think we can sort of all get behind a little bit. But then he says that nobody would willingly do something that is against their interest, right? So anybody who acts without virtue is then acting against their interest, which is a good. And therefore, it's a lack of wisdom that's making them act that way. Which is sort of strange because you sort of imagine, let's say, like a tyrannical king, you know, who's really smart. They know how to get power. They're doing all this, doing this, and they end up with all this power in charge of everything, you know, in charge of all those around them. Socrates would argue, well, no, he lacks wisdom because he doesn't realize that he's acting unvirtuously and therefore he's harming himself because the situation he's in. And I think it's pretty easy to turn around. A lot of contemporaries said, well, how is he harming himself? He's rich, you know, has whatever he wants, and, you know, he's a king. And I guess he would argue that. Well, no, not only is he afraid that he'll always lose his power, but none of these things actually did any real good. So basically he says that wisdom is the ability to, you know, <clears throat> you're gathering wisdom. If you actually have the wisdom about a situation, you'll never act against yourself. It's just like, for example, someone says you want $100, you want $10. You have the wisdom to know that $100 is more, so you pick that every time. The idea is that wisdom and virtue go hand in hand. Even though wisdom is a virtue, wisdom is also the virtue that allows you to reach any of it. 
I guess my my confusion there and the example of like a hundred versus ten dollars, right? If it's just for you, like that seems like an obvious pick. And I mean, I assume that's why you chose it. But I think like you know, it's hard to say like wisdom always has one right answer, right? Like you know that there's there's always a thing that is wisest to do, and then there are things from there that become less wise. Like I guess I wonder what would what would Socrates say to that, or like what would his response to be to to the idea that like you know wisdom could be varied, or like maybe there could be multiple right answers or something like that. I think that gets to a very important one where, like I said, you know, we need to keep, I'll keep saying this again and again, maybe, you know, ad nauseum, but he thought he knew nothing. Like he tried to think about it all the time. He questioned everyone. He thought about himself all the time and still decided he knows nothing. And his basically belief is that, um, this is sort of talked about and really debated whether it's Plato or Socrates here, but I, I personally think it's Socrates based off of no real evidence. Just it feels right to me. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. That's um, kind of evidence. Uh, but basically, I you know this idea of, you know, correct opinion, as it's called, right, that um, people who act virtuously a lot, you know, we, I think we can all agree, even though even if you can't define what virtue is, you can look at this guy acting a certain way and say, okay, he's acting virtuously. And I guess his argument is that they're acting with correct opinion, that they are doing the right thing based on opinion, but they don't actually know what they're doing is right. And I think the idea is you just kind of can't even do it, but you have to sort of think about it and try to find it. Because he, he sort of compares it to a ship, that a ship can go the right place, sort of just by chance, by corrupt being, by like thinking about it. But if you had a map, it'd be a lot easier to go where you want to be. And basically that knowing what virtue is, is like that map. You can quickly like lead yourself to the right life. But with the correct opinion, you kind of just get swayed by, you know, your own brain, the sort of, in the ancient Greek world, you'd say like the gods and their whims for you. Um, and sort of, I guess his argument is that you should try to live a life based on virtue because virtue is the only good. But also, I mean, he never claimed it was easy nor even necessarily possible. And that's what's sort of hard because, um, you know, it's it's hard to see how we can really take him seriously if he's saying, do all this for the sake of virtue. Also, I've never even came close to reaching virtue and I did my entire life for it for 70 years and even died for it, as we'll sort of talk about later. Which I agree is, I think, an issue with Socrates, but I think what makes him such a captivating figure for the ancient world and for us today. Actually, just a brief like side note, a point of clarification. Um, you've mentioned a couple times that, hey, we don't know if this was said by Plato or Socrates. Like, where's that confusion coming from? Oh, yeah, I, I apologize for that. So I think it's, like I said sort of earlier, Socrates didn't write anything. But I forgot to sort of mention with Plato. So Plato wrote almost exclusively, at least of the writings we have them, in dialogues. Right? They would be conversations between two people. And over history, it's been wildly varying how legit we think these are. So it used to be, you know, it's a certain point where people thought, okay, these are all just more or less conversations that actually happened between Socrates and another person, and uh, Plato just sort of transcribed them. Um, and then people sort of began to change and say, well, no, these are entirely just made up by Plato. He's putting words into Socrates' mouth that he could have said, but they're entirely his own beliefs. And, you know, now I think it's, you know, the easy cop-out answers. It's somewhere in between. Where now I think a lot of people think, the earlier dialogues of Plato, you know, right after Socrates' death, you know, when he's still sort of fresh on his mind, those are actually things that Socrates believed and quote-unquote would have said, even if he didn't actually say them, because we sort of will talk about later that Socrates, Plato even puts in one of his the writings that he wasn't there for when this event happened. Um, but I think a lot of people now think, and it makes a lot of sense, that the later dialogues, he just kind of put Socrates in there, maybe as sort of respect for his teacher, because that was his teacher, or maybe um, sort of just to give his arguments extra strength by attaching it to such a prolific figure even at the time. But I think a lot of people think that the later works of Plato are all Plato and the earlier works of Socrates are more or less quotes of Socrates. And that's, it's hard though, because the, he's the only real philosophical source we have because he was the only philosopher. A lot of historians wrote about Socrates, but not a whole lot of philosophers necessarily did. All right. Well, I mean, We've gone through some great stuff so far. Um, great introduction. And we're back. This is School of Athens. I'm Avik Wadavkar. I'm Carter Otis. I'm Charlie Scales, and we're back with our guest host, Holden Xavier Charisma. Ooh, Xavier is such a, such a nice middle name. It's, yeah, it's very solid. Glad to have it. XQ as a middle and last initial. I'm pretty proud. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, we left off over some brief overviews of Socrates, some of how Plato's writings have informed us about Socrates, some of Socrates' beliefs on virtue. Now, what do we have next? I believe Socrates said a couple things about the soul. Ooh, the soul. Very exciting. Yeah, tell us more, Holden. <laughs> All right. I'd be happy to. <laughs> so, yeah, I think 
the soul is the other thing that we were talking about and I sort of hinted about it earlier with sort of epistemologically is sometimes how it's categorized, but it's sort of hard to say because it's uh, sort of out there as far as uh, theories go. And this is another one that's very, very, very contentious about whether it's Plato or Socrates. And it's really gone back and forth about, okay, like what degree, what degree. But I think most people believe there was at least something that Socrates would have entertained as an idea. Um, and so basically his view was, uh, and we sort of kind of hinted at this earlier with the fact that he didn't care for material good at all, is that we should only care for our soul because that's like, you know, the true important part of ourselves. That we're a body and a soul. And, you know, the body, we can walk around with it. We can talk to people with it. You know, it's like a tool. But the soul is actually who we are. And, you know, the way that he even sort of compares it in a lot of his uh, writings is quoted by Plato, which also makes it sort of difficult. Um, or even, but this is another one that's also talked about by Xenophon, which is pretty important. They say, well, you know, you'd go to a carpenter to get a table fixed, for example. You'd go to a doctor to get your arm fixed, and you should be at questioning yourself and talking with philosophers and, you know, being a philosopher yourself and thinking constantly to get your soul fixed. And this is most important because your soul, which soul is maybe a difficult word for this because soul, again, sort of includes the mind. It's not like you're necessarily in just religious sense, right? But that is the most important thing. So you should actually be looking at that above all these other things. And that sort of gets to his point where he's like, I don't care about any of these material possessions because my soul, I'm just always questioning it, and that's more worth it. And that's where we get his other really famous quote is that, you know, the unexamined life is not worth living, that, you know, you're looking after your soul. You're looking after your most, you know, your greatest gift, basically, uh, every time that you think about stuff. So basically, why would you not do it? Because then your life wouldn't be worth living. Could we could we talk about the Greek for soul there, and uh, specifically the, because um, I know Heraclitus also. I mean, I, I, I guess you might not know about this, but uh, or exactly the exact word, but um, Heraclitus also talked about the soul, and we talked about him last week. Um, just a reminder: he was the one that believed that the universe is constantly changing; it was dynamic, uh, can't step in the same river twice, all that. So, uh, I guess just elucidate the soul. Yeah. Um- I didn't, so I've only read, uh, I'll, you know, I'll level with you right now. The only one I've read uh, in actual Greek itself in its entirety is Plato's Crito, which doesn't really talk too much about this. A lot of this stuff comes from Plato's Phaedo, which I've only read in English. That being said, I believe the word, what's the most common word, is suke, which is where I get psychology from is sort of that word, and it can also mean breath, soul, spirit, all that kind of stuff. It's sort of a, it's one of those words that there's no real translation. We usually, you know, land on soul, you know, as a direct translation, but I know one thing I sort of heard about in uh, uh, this article I was reading is that, you know, it's the philosophy press professor who'll always do this exercise with the students where he says, define what suke is in Plato's Phaedo, and you cannot use the word soul is another thing, too, where it's sort of like, cause it's not just the soul. It's not, you know, it's hard to hear that without the connotation it brings up. But it is it is like an idea of sort of your combined mind and soul, and like it's related to your breath, so it's sort of like an airy spirit type thing, kind of like a ghost but it isn't like, you know, you know, Halloween spooky, you know, sort of thing. It's it's sort of, it's a word that's hard to define. People talk about it. Like people who are a lot better versed in the Greek language than I are spend a lot of time annotating it. So, Yeah, and I think uh, just this dictionary from UChicago says, uh, suke, also seat of the feelings. It might be an mm. alternative translation um, or conducting the souls of the dead in uh, you know, Hades' sense, but um, right. I mean, seat of the feelings, that's that's an interesting, uh, I guess, distinction. Because Holden, when you brought up the soul, or at least Tsuke, in um, you know this context, it seemed more focused on the soul as uh, something to think, something to examine, um, to practice rational thought. And so is this, does the soul also contain, I guess, emotional thought as well? Because at, at least in our modern world, people always say, you know, um, reason versus emotion, right? We see this dichotomy, we see this distinction. Um, was the dis- dis- distinction also apparent within like Socrates' thought, or did the soul um, be essentially all your mental states? So this is one of those things that's actually pretty interesting about Socrates. We talk about him as like a legendary figure. That this was one of the you know it's hard to think of him as almost like almost like a religious figure, right? And you imagine like you know say like a religious figure, and afterward it's a bunch of just competing factions kind of fighting for their image. Like, this was a point of contention a lot for the Epicureans and Stoics in the Hellenistic era, right? Where the Stoics said, well, and I was sort of talking about here that the soul is immortal and it knows everything. And it's clearly like Socrates was talking about. It's just about thinking. It's just about thought. It's just about, you know, this and that. And it's about, you know, the logos of the universe. It's a place where you think logically. Logos and logically sort of go hand in hand, right? 
That's what it's about. And the Epicureans say, no, that's actually just as much, if not even more, about the emotional state of things, just as much about like the sensations you feel about things. And they often point it to, well, yeah, Socrates did argue for moderation. We also argue for moderation, but he didn't say stay away from pleasure. They should go ahead and live a pleasurable life if you want. And so that's one of those things that's really interesting because Socrates' words on top of it, it's one of those things where you're looking through sort of a picture of a picture of a picture, like playing a complex game of philosophical telephone that you don't know exactly what he said. You're looking at it from multiple people's angles. And then after that, multiple people interpret it to fit their narratives. And that was in the 300s BC. Who knows what's happened you know, in between then, the other people sort of changing their narratives around. I mean, I know all the Hellenistic schools had their stuff sort of swapped and messed up, you know, around like the you know, quote unquote dark ages, as we talk about. So it's, it's hard to necessarily say for sure. Um, I think I personally like go with the idea that it's all about sort of, you know, thinking logically because I think he sort of says next after that, that you know, the soul, uh, this is a very important thing there. So I don't want to just jump to it too quickly, but like that souls have existed for an eternity. And that's the new thing because Suke was a widely accepted Greek thing at the time that, you know, there's a soul and there's a body. Um, and the exact, you know, what it means necessarily uh, was sort of hard because a lot of, like I said, we tra- it couldn't be translated just as breath that like, well, it's like when you exhale, it's like the air inside of you. That's your soul. And it's like pretty easy to do. And I think that's probably maybe the common or thought, but there's a lot of philosophical thought about it. But his the argument is that, well, it exists. It's a soul. It doesn't necessarily cover on exactly whether it's logical or just emotional. I think he sort of hints at it being logical. Um, but he says it's existed for an eternity. It knows everything because it existed for an eternity. And therefore, every single thing we learn is just recollection. Um, and then that becomes a pretty important thing for uh getting out of paradoxes of knowledge, basically saying that you can reach knowledge, we just haven't necessarily. And it's just about this slow process of recollecting that'll help you reach knowledge. It's sort of a way to get out of paradoxes, but also it's a, it's a really interesting thing to get my head around because I still don't fully, I think it's hard to buy. And this, this uh, you know, example of it, you know, it's a famous example of it, I think I'll read a little bit later because it's sort of hard to wrap your head around. But it's the idea that we understand these forms, and this is another one because they're very, very platonic, but I still uh, wanted to include it just because... Honestly, we need to have sure. stuff to talk about. And then I was like, <laughs> but yeah. I mean, sorry. Well, I mean, if we don't have anything else, then we might as well talk about forms right now. All right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> By all means, I'd be happy to. Um, so basically, these forms that are talked about, and they're usually attributed to Plato, but some people think the earliest parts of the uh, thought were given by Socrates because these are still in the early Platonic dialogues. And basically, that here's an example that I'll just read word for word that I sort of seen. And it's hard to wrap your head around it. So, you know. For example, we're able to perceive that two sticks are equal in length but unequal in width only because we have an innate understanding of the form of equality. Right? This idea, this abstract idea of equality, we can sort of see that. And that we have an innate understanding of what it means for something to be equal, even though no two things we encounter and experience are themselves perfectly equal. Since we can grasp this form of equal, even though we never encounter it, encounter it and experience, our grasping of it must be a recollection of, imp- of immortal knowledge we had and forgot prior to birth. This argument implies that the soul must have existed prior to birth and in turn implies that the soul's life extends beyond that of our bodies. Um, and this idea, which he uses, you know, he in through Plato, once again, sorry, I to say, uses it multiple times, you know, famously in Mino, he sort of says, Mino's like, well, how can we know anything if to know something we have to know we don't know? And at what point do we know to stop? You know, how do you know where the destination is if you don't even know what the destination is? You don't have the knowledge to know where the destination is. He says, well, actually, if it's just recollection, you'll kind of know when you see it sort of type thing, where you see equality, you kind of know when you see it because it's sort of recollection. And this also gets an important thing is that if he believes in the immortality of the soul, that makes him fear death a lot less, which is sort of, you know, tragically near the end of the podcast and near the end of his life, you'll see he sort of had to face that. And so this kind of, this kind of goes back to Pythagoras, doesn't it? The, you know, infinity of the soul, the uh, uh, Pythagoras, I don't know, the first, maybe first, but... Um, believed in reincarnation, right? And that was huge for Greece. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting that I, if it is Socrates, that despite not knowing anything, he, he has this idea that, you know, clearly this is, you know, infinite ancient knowledge from, you know, a divine source. And I think that's, that's quite, quite fascinating. It is pretty interesting. And this is where you get to that uh, strange distinction. I think a lot of people sort of uh, don't like this title of, pre-Socratic and post-Socratic philosophers because really, I mean, Socrates, as far as we can tell with him, would not have considered himself that way. It was really only kind of Plato, but especially uh, Aristotle who sort of began to work with that. I mean, to be fair, he did it as a way of saying, well, actually, uh, 
Socrates and I, we are the other two really great ones. Plato was only okay in between. He wasn't a huge fan of him afterward, even though he was a teacher. But um, it was sort of, it was not necessarily a like tag that was there for what Socrates would have agreed with, because it's true. He did take a lot. Not even take, you know, he learned a lot from pre-Socratics. You know, there's a, a dialogue he allegedly had with Parmenides. Um, there's, you know, he sort of talked about as a early you know, ontolo- ontologist, you know, talking about existence. And he talked a lot with, you know, quote unquote pre-Socratics because he learned through them. And I agree that a lot of the stuff he says has some grounding in that. And I don't think, I think to talk about virtue and to talk about questioning so strongly, that was uniquely Socratic. But I think a lot of his other stuff is sort of overhyped because he literally is, you know, the pre-Socratic and post-Socratic era. It's, he is the name of it. It's like, you know, BC and AD, so we're talking about it. It's decided that he was so important that not only are people going to be fighting for his legacy for centuries to come, but also that he is the before and after era. And I just think, I don't think he would have seen himself that way. I don't think anyone really saw him that himself that way, except for Plato, who just truly loved him because he was such a great teacher to him. I mean, to this notion about forms and this idea of perfection, right? Would this, I mean, not constitute, maybe constitute isn't the right word, uh, but I don't know, would this be some sort of implication that you mentioned form of equality. Does everything have a form? I mean, equality is a concept, right? So do material things also have some like form, some, because the form of equality is, I, I assume, the perfect concept of equality, even though we don't experience that in our everyday life. Is it limited to concepts? Are all things just concepts? So this is, I think, one of those prime examples where, like I said, I feel like I'm just, I feel like a broken record here talking about Plato, Socrates, Plato, Socrates, who said who, what, who said what, you know? And I think... um Plato, most definitely, once again, through the voice of Socrates, but most people agree this is almost entirely Plato, did believe there was a form for every single thing, that there was a form. There was out there in the world, sort of is how it's often phrased, right? That out there somewhere, not in the world, but in a like idealized world beyond ours, in the metaphysical world, there's an ideal apple there. There's the perfect form of apple, and every other apple is like a representation of that form that we can recognize. We never see the real form. Like All our world is just a imperfect collection of perfect forms. And I think with physical items, they sort of said that just as a sake of sometimes consistency, really. I mean, it didn't really matter that much to them. I mean, they're philosophers. They don't, you know, oftentimes they don't get bogged down in apples and stuff. They talk about, you know, this is justice. This is true justice exists out there. And you know, true equality exists out there. And true virtue exists out there. And true bravery exists out there. And here in our world, it sort of kind of goes with that correct opinion idea type thing that, well, out there is that true form. We can kind of imitate it, but it's not ever going to be perfect. Um, and you should try to make it perfect so that you don't get uh, you know, manipulated by other people. You can try to make it perfect. And I think the idea of these really abstract ideas being um, in forms, I think some would argue was started by Socrates. The idea of every little thing having a form, which definitely Plato believed. I think a lot of people sort of said that's probably not something Socrates was too concerned with because he was so focused on virtue and wisdom. He was hyper-focused on those two things. And so, you know, how could you be worrying about almost the radical skepticism we see centuries and centuries later with Descartes, right, about, like, well, what's around you is real, what around you is ideal. He's like, well, I don't worry too much about that. I'm just going to try to be virtuous and try to find wisdom to sort of initially prove someone wrong, but now sort of try to live my life. Yeah, I think that that um, Descartes, thing you said about Descartes is kind of interesting because thing I, a kind of contention I have with Descartes is that, you know, why worry about what is real? And I think Socrates is kind of touching on that where he says, okay, maybe maybe nothing is real, but what you can do is be virtuous. And this is kind of something we also saw in the Stoics, right? Is that, you know, even if nothing matters, and I think Socrates would kind of agree with this, that, you know, you can't really do much in this world. But what you can do is try to isolate virtue and try to go after it, and that's what he was doing his whole life. So I think that's, that it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting how, you know, Descartes kind of lost got lost in his thought, I guess, in a little a little... And Socrates kind of so firmly planted in reality or or what he wants to be reality that he chases after it, which I think is a little bit more noble. Yeah, I would say I can sort of see that. And I think um, the one thing that I would like to sort of add on to that is that, and we sort of didn't talk this much about uh, in virtue section, I sort of actually skipped past it, but the really important idea of him being like the gadfly, as he's described, right? You know, a gadfly, the way it travels, you know, with a cow and the cow is sort of annoyed by it. Um, and, but he's basically saying, well, the Athenian public, they are sort of this cow and it's misled. 
and he's the gadfly who he knows he's annoying. He knows he's an inconvenience to be around. He knows people don't like being around him. But he's saying, I'm pushing you to the right place, the way a gadfly pushes a horse, pushes a cow. He's saying, you know, I'm going to push you in this direction because it's my duty to help you because I actually know what virtue is, or at least I know how to kind of try to get there. And he, he taught for free. This is one thing, I mean, he got made fun of all the time for being, you know, pie in the sky and being, you know, Aristophanes sort of spoofed him saying, you know, he's a you know, sophist, he's just another sophist, and these sophists are the people who uh, took a bunch of money to sort of teach these kids uh, rhetoric and philosophical beliefs. And he says, no, I will offer you, I will teach you for free. I, will, I mean, I'll teach you without you even asking me, but it's because I want you to find wisdom and I want you to do it. And this uh, idea of Socratic ignorance saying that we can end our conversation where all, almost all the early and basically all the platonic dialogues end is that this idea they're like, I don't really know what comes next. This Socratic ignorance is impasse they reach. They have no idea what to say. I think Socrates is saying, but at least around that point, you're a blank slate and then you can join me in trying to find anything that's actually virtuous. I think a lot of that description sounds to me, I don't know, what we stereotype philosophers as is like, you know, they won't shut up and like they, they keep talking. And I guess I kind of wonder like, you know, what, what gives Socrates the right to say that he's like, you know, the purveyor of virtue or that, you know, he is like the, the teacher of the public. Like, is, is there any justification that he provided to say like, here, here's what gives me like, you know, the ability to say these things or the ability to, I guess, lecture the public, you know, even involuntarily, like, you know, was was there anything that he cited for like a reason that he could be more virtuous? So one thing he always would point out is, you know, I think we talked about he just, I think like you said, like like a lot of philosophers really believe is that, well, I understand the truth and you guys don't. So why wouldn't I not tell you the truth? But I think it's easy to say everyone thinks what they have is the truth. But another thing that he had, which once again is, you know, pretty convenient that only he can see it is that, and it's sort of not talked about that much, but it's like idea of a daimonion, I believe is how it's sort of called in Greek, which daimon is sort of the word for spirit or deity. It's where we get the word demon from. Um, and it's basically that he had this really almost sounds like a, like a voice inside your head. It's really all can be said that would tell him his divine signs. I was often called would tell him stuff to do. It would say, do this, don't do this. Don't. Actually, it's one of those things that Xenophon says it only told him not to do stuff. <laughs> Plato said it could tell him to do stuff and not to do stuff, which is sort of a weird thing to add, but he definitely claimed to have had one of these. Um, and that sort of gave him an extra leg up because I mean, it's hard to deny. So, and people really don't mention this because he really was a, you know, intellectual person. He was really the founder of a lot of this you know, idea of like Western intellectualism. So people don't really want to, you know, kind of want to brush over this idea that he said, well, actually I got a, a divine voice speaking with me. And there's been a lot of scholarship about, well, is the divine voice like a consciousness? And he's sort of, you know, hinting at the idea of a subconscious, you know, he was that early to that. And I, I don't want to, you know, be one of those people who sort of press his stuff on him because a lot of people do. I don't really know what it is, but definitely he said in his defense speeches and sort of out there his life that he had this divine spirit telling him what to do. And so that came out of the fact that he knows the truth. Who better to do it? And then also I think just one final thing is that it was way, way, way more common to do this in Athens than I think we'd ever imagine today. It was a philosophical capital. You know, the Agora, you know, we Agora here in uh you know, Phillips Exeter, uh, you know, is a public space that uh Everyone would sort of go to when you could just be talked to there, and it was just sort of expected that you, people would just kind of come up at you and start talking to you. And it would have been less weird than if someone just sort of came into your house, knocking on your door, and started just randomly lecturing you. It was, he did it in public areas, but he did he definitely did it with it. His, and I guess to the final point, sorry, I, I had been talking for a while, is that a lot of people sort of agreed with you, uh, Carter, and he was killed for it. I mean, that's like what it comes down to. I mean, I think I people say, you know, why do you think you're so great? Just, you know, some random... There was a lot of classism there, you know, poor, ugly dude. Why are you telling us, telling, you know, our children how to live life, especially when you're talking to the children? So that's, I think that was a thing a lot of people thought. All right. And welcome back. This is School of Athens. I'm your host, Avik Wadifer. Well, co-host Avik Wadifer. I am another co-host, Carter Otis. <laughs> I'm your third co-host, Charlie Scales, and we have our special guest. Holden, middle name redacted, Charisma. Ooh, middle name redacted. I see we have some character development. Mm, character uh, arc is starting. All right, so where do we leave off? We were talking about Socrates and uh, and children. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking about Socrates. We were talking about people getting annoyed at Socrates, and people actually got so annoyed that um, well, what happened, Holden? Yeah, I'm. I mean, so like I said, I think we have to continue to you know put this point down that I think even. 
more than I think we talk about, you know, current philosophers are pretty self-righteous, but at least they're, you know, they have the dignity to sort of lock themselves up in their room and write a bunch of stuff and, you know, sort of be self-righteous that way. But he says, no, I'm going to go out of the screen and make it your problem, my righteousness, um, in a way that I think people really found annoying, especially with the rich of the city, because uh, he was teaching their kids. And so basically he was brought to trial um, on the grounds of corrupting the youth and bringing in new gods to Athens slash not believing in the previous gods, you know, that existed to protect the city, which... As you can imagine, at that time, in that place, but really at any time, at any place, you know, denying the gods uh, and bringing in new ones is never going to go over too well. And corrupting the youth is also, you know, people love people love their children. Well, well you know, don't do that. <laughs> so when we say corrupting the youth, is this? Because I think this is something we've we've talked before about this. Is this something that they're afraid of? Is this something that? He's teaching them to question everything, to not be sure of every, and every, to not be sure of anything, um, and kind of that throws away this whole dynastic system, right? <laughs> Where you know you want your kids to know, oh yeah, I'm the best. I want to go after these things. But if he's saying, you know, you know nothing, and, and we should like try to go after it was really just, they're going to start seeing these holes in this in this system and start seeing like, oh maybe I shouldn't be, you know, you know, inheriting all this wealth and money <laughs> and land and stuff. So. I like you touched on that a little bit. I think you got it exactly right that, you know, they didn't like sort of his you know, counter-revolution. He was sort of beginning with these people questioning everything. But also, you know, with his search for virtue, his search for, you know, I'm going to look for what virtue is. I'm going to find it with my wisdom. One of the leading beliefs back then, especially among the elite, was that, well, virtue is inherited, obviously. Your dad's virtuous. Your mom's virtuous. You're going to be virtuous, right? And that's... Really, really convenient for the people who are in charge. They'll say, well, I'm virtuous. Obviously, I'm in charge. And, you know, a lot of people said they define virtue as, you know, having political office, having a lot of power. So, obviously, I'm virtuous. So, of course, my son and my daughter, well, really more so son. It was, it was ancient Greece. It was not a very progressive place. My son, well, he's also going to be very virtuous. So, yeah, let's give him all that power. Let's, like, let him, you know, inherit it. I think it's the same idea that not only was it causing them to question these orders, but also it made... Other people question it because they said, well, yeah, if virtue isn't inherited, then why do they deserve all these things? And that's something that in a dialogue called Mino, right, one of the um, – Plato was actually a very good writer. He had a lot of foreshadowing and stuff. He was – and he was thinking of as a philosopher, but he was actually a great writer and considered that way in the ancient world. And he sort of has sinisterly one of these people who ends up accusing Socrates come up and say, oh, uh, you know, you don't think so- – um, <clears throat> you'd really not think virtue is inherited. And Socrates says, no, not at all. There's so many sons who are terrible and fathers who are great. Just look through all of history. It's ridiculous to say that it's uh, inherited. And then the son, then the, the accuser sort of just goes out on his own. And then we find out years later, he's on that jury that ends up, you know, condemning Socrates for corrupting the youth. So what I'm hearing is that Socrates challenged philosophical nepotism. Yeah. I think, well, I think the thing is he challenged Literally everything. Mm-hmm. But I'd say strongest of all, he really challenged this idea of philosophical nepotism because he says, like, my whole point of challenging everything is to find virtue. And that really, if your whole thing is, yeah, virtue, just get it. Uh, that really challenges that a lot. So, I mean, all this kind of came up to a point, right? You mentioned people on a jury. His, what, so he had a trial? Yeah, he has a, uh, a very, very famous trial. I think people talk about it a lot. There's a lot of art of it. There's that famous... You know, French painting out there, you know, he's, you know, trial of Socrates, very, very important moment for, you know, the history of the world, especially the history of philosophy. And so this famous trial, you know, I think a pretty funny thing to mention is that um, we get this sort of talked about in the Apology of Plato, as it's called, and also the Apology of Xenophon. But in the Apology of Plato, Plato actually mentions in there that Plato was unable to attend because he was sick, um, which is, I think, sort of kind of funny that he wrote that in there. But it also kind of shows that he wasn't trying to, you know, dupe the public into saying, you know, this is I, this is an exact quote I saw there. I was there. I think it's sort of like a, this is what he would have said. This is what he could have said. This is what I think he would have said and stuff like that. Because, you know, he really looked up to his teacher. Um, and so Socrates basically shows up and in his, you know, typical Socrates sense, and this is one of the things you have to take with a grain of salt because we don't have any of the juror's perspective. Um, we have just Xenophon and uh, <clears throat> Plato's who both really love the guy. But basically he shows up and he just absolutely owns the jury. You know, he just basically... You know, they're all using these like impassioned speeches. You know, their hands are waving everywhere. You know, they're saying this and this and that. The, and Socrates is in a sort of calm voice, not getting angry at all, not feels you know not really invested at all. He just kind of makes them contradict themselves, makes them look like idiots, um, and just kind of just owns them. You know, and uh, it makes it pretty clear 
right? that he has done nothing but help the people of Athens. So in at least the speech, he says, well, no, your kids, it's good. They're questioning things. You know, I'm helping them lead the path of virtue. And actually, you're telling me that I don't, that I am, am not pious. I know the gods will... The gods gave me a free, you know, sign inside my head that tells me to do stuff. So I'm pretty good to the gods. You know, they must like me enough to give me this stuff. And also, the Oracle of Delphi said I was the wisest person. So who are you saying doesn't like the gods? And then he also, you know, does this quick sequence where he gets one of the accusers to admit that he believes in demigods. And he also later gets him to admit that demigods are a type of god. And he says, well, you just admitted I believe in gods. And then, you know, the accuser gets really angry. Um, and I think that's sort of just how it shows. It's this typical Socratic way. Like I said, I think the Socratic way is questioning a lot, but also... Like I said, I, I hate to keep using this word because, you know, don't use it too much slang. But it really is like trolling. It really is just, you know, making these people you know, sort of look like idiots because he wants everyone to realize how ignorant they are. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, so he treats the jury like idiots. Well, he doesn't treat the jury like idiots, but he gets them to contradict himself. He gets them to, you know, run themselves in circles. Um, I'm guessing the jury doesn't like this. Oh, no, not at all. And I think, actually, I sort of agree with your original statement. He does treat them like idiots. He definitely wants them to feel kind of stupid, and he wants them to feel kind of stupid. And um, he basically says, as sort of, once again, another way to, like, I guess, troll them, right? He says, well, they say, what do you think your punishment should be? He said, I think my punishment should actually be a reward, and I should get free meals for my life because, you know, I'm helping educate your kids, and I'm helping lead them to virtue, and, you know, I'm super pious. I should be rewarded, so, you know, I... You know, you're basically saying, you know, I accept your apology. I know you guys shouldn't have brought me here. You know, we'll just let bygones be gone. Give me some free meals. And he knows it's not going to go over well. He's just, you know, sort of trying to say this whole thing's sort of a joke. He's trying to live his good life. Um, but it's not one of those things where I think a lot of times it's presented as a, you know, impassioned, you know, I'm going to stand up to them and show them who's boss. It really is, I think, something where it's sort of like he's just sort of playing with them, sort of joking with them. And he is trying to make a stand to say, like, I didn't do anything wrong. But he isn't trying to do it in a really impassioned way. He's just saying. Why don't you give me free meals? You know, why not? He's really nonchalant the whole time. I think it's kind of uh, funny and a really characteristic of the end of Socrates' life. Um, and, of course, they say, no, we are not going to be giving you free meals. And then he says, okay, fine. This is another thing that Xenophon and Plato disagree on. He says, but basically says, he says, okay, I should be a really, really low fee. You know, and I think there's, Plato sort of talks about this um, specifically in a lot of his dialogues. He says, well, if you just said right then and there, I'd be happy to be exiled then you, you, they would have definitely let you out. If you said anything other than the minimum punishment, you could have escaped with your life, totally. They didn't, like, well, I guess I'm giving a bit of a spoiler alert, but come on, it happened 399 BC. They end up voting to kill him. Um, and he's sort of saying that you had the opportunity to impose exile on yourself, or even to ask them what they wanted. But you said free meals and then low penalty. You say, it's like if you kill someone, you say, all right, give me a reward. And they're like, no, we're not giving you a reward. It's like, fine, $50 parking ticket then. And that's... I mean, he, well, you had to have known that it was going to enrage them. And he's like, yeah, I mean, maybe it would have enraged them, but I'd rather, I don't want to admit that what I did was wrong. I don't want to leave my home either, sort of a thing that Xenophon's, because like, so Plato's a lot more philosopher. Xenophon's kind of like a normal guy who really looked up at Socrates, and he's like, well, you know, I'm old. I don't want to leave home. I don't know why I'd exile myself. And then, you know, Plato's like, no, I, I wanted to, you know, die believing what I believe in. And so they vote for him to be killed. Wow, sounds like a, a such a poetic ending for Socrates. I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess I do wonder. I mean, you're the you're the student of the classics. Like, I mean, you you talked before about how possibly all of this can be distorted through time and different translations and different layers of you know different scholars. But I mean, you feel like this, or at least you know, like kind of the story that you've woven is like accurate at least to what happened, or, or semi accurate. I mean, I don't know. It, it it seems very like you know mystical and, and legendary. I, I I guess I just kind of wonder. Like, is it possible that it's you know made up or at least partially invented yeah i think you know it's almost definitely is partially invented i didn't even sort of get to the thing next one after one where he's in prison you know awaiting his death and his best childhood friend crido comes up who's this rich guy now that's, that's the one text i read fully in greek so you know it's a special place in my heart uh, and he says you know let's get out of here i could totally get you out of here i'm super rich i can just bribe the guard and we'll skip town and he's like no even knowing now that i'm going to die you know and this is where it's sort of interesting. He sets up like this first idea of sort of like a social contract. He's the first one to say, is like, you know, I lived in Athens. It's treated me well, educated me well. You know, I've paid my dues. I've been here multiple time. I'm not going to break its laws because even, even though I completely agree that my death is unjust, unjust uh, it's also unjust for me to break the laws. You know, two wrongs don't make a right, basically. And I am setting a bad example if I break the laws. 
So I'm just going to stay here and let them kill me, whatever. I know I know it's stupid, but whatever. And it's you know, one of these, like, typical things that I think really shows his, uh, his, you know, him being a bit of, like, a chat, I guess, sort of way. It's like his childhood friend is next to him crying in jail, saying, no, Socrates, you can't die, you can't die, you can't die. And he's like, Dude, don't worry about it. It's fine. Like, I'm just, I'll die. You know, who cares? Like, it's generally just, it doesn't bother him because I think we sort of get that same idea we saw. He thinks the soul is eternal. And he thinks that even if the soul is internal, he's going to go in a place with virtuous people. So he's not really worried, or at least that's how it's presented. That being said, this very well could be sort of mythical. But it is interesting that this is one of the things that Xenophon and Plato both wrote an apology of Socrates, and they definitely agree on a lot of this stuff. You know, I talked about some of the technicalities they disagree on, but this is the event that they both completely talked about. The you know, trial and death of Socrates was really important to both of them. And so I think a lot of what happens really is true because they both wrote about it and they sort of fact check yourself. Whereas a lot of the other stuff we've actually talked about has pretty much just been from Plato and he can make up whatever he wants. But Xenophon also has no reason to make stuff up the way that Plato kind of does for philosophical reasons. So I think a lot of this actually is, you know, completely true or at least partially true. And I do agree there's a lot of epic parts added, but I think the overall historical events are true. So now that we're ending this podcast just in a few minutes, I, I think we should touch on his influence. I mean, obviously, it's extraordinary. It is probably the biggest influence in, <laughs> up to this point in history. Um, so, um, I mean, you talked about Plato, we talked about Xenophon, and these are the people that we remember Socrates by who wrote about him. So I think if you uh, just elaborated on uh, his uh, influence, I guess. Yeah, I think his influence is one of those things that you're is sort of not you can't really even quantify it it's over i think it sort of starts with you know there's definitely an argument that he is the one who really starts that questioning that he's the first person to really question everything that i think ends up the basis of this uh world of athens that is also all invested in questioning that kind of ends up in the hellenistic world because he doesn't start immediately after the hellenistic world there's uh socrates then there's plato and then aristotle lives in the hellenistic world uh, a student of plato but he sets this up. He lets it start. And this whole Hellenistic world of this question, 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 and questioning is definitely considered to be one of those things that when refounded in the you know, 1300s in like Europe is what started like the scientific revolution. So in that sense, I think he indirectly true, but still like, largely because of, entirely because of him, really, I would say even we have that scientific revolution, we have this idea of questioning, but far, far, far more directly. His influence is on Plato and Aristotle, you know, two sorts of people in that subsequent generation, generation and generation afterward. They both, you know, really looked up to him. They wrote a lot about him, especially Plato. Um, and they, all of their works, sort of, they keep him as someone who's there to the point where it's hard to tell, especially like I said, talking about Plato, who's in his own right, one of the most influential people to ever live, what percent even comes from Socrates. And that's, I think, just a testament to Socrates' legacy that he was so great that people wanted to write so much about him. But then I think the Hellenistic schools are one of the most interesting ones because uh, you know, the Hellenistic schools, I think the main ones you get are the Cynics, the Skeptics, the Epicureans, and the Stoics. You know, um, I don't know if you guys have talked about them previously on this podcast yet, but basically, um, they all sort of like basically, like I said, in this imagining him as a, and I think he is like a religious figure, the way he dies in such an you know, epic way, like hard to sort of point it out. It's like it's hard to see as any way that like, he sacrificed himself for this virtuous life, and everyone sees it that way. And so they all sort of try to take a little bit of him and say, this is Socrates and this is how it fits into my school. So the Stoics, like I think you sort of hinted at earlier, the Stoics say, well, Socrates, he said, virtue is the only good. And that works in with us. Virtue is the only good. The Epicureans, like we sort of talked about, they said that, uh, you know, there's that idea of the suke with pleasure. But also, even more importantly, they say, Socrates says, don't fear death. And we say, don't fear death. We are the inheritors of Socrates, right? And then the Cynics say, uh, Socrates said, don't worry about material possessions. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. And he lived a very uh, simple life. And, you know, we talk, if you know any of the Cynics, they lived a very, very, very simple life. He said, we are the sons of Socrates. And the um, uh, skeptics, they say, Socrates said question everything, and we literally question everything. We are the sons of Socrates. And all of these schools, all of them claim Socrates their own. And I think that is a clear example of Socrates' legacy, that he is so great, so beloved by everybody uh, in the philosophical world that they say they all are basically just trying their hardest to be him. Say, he was part of our school, kind of, if you squint. Um, and we are his true successors. I think that is the, his true sign of influence on just the Western world as a whole, and really just the world as a whole. This isn't just the Western world, uh, but his philosophy, I think he has to be the most influential individual, in my opinion. 
So, so we're uh, nearing around the end of our end of our hour. Uh, we'll be right back with a brief overview of what we went over today. Yeah, and thank you so much, Holden, for being on this podcast. I know you got a dash, but uh, appreciate you so much, and uh, hope to be, have you back on maybe in the future. No, thank you. It was, it was a great time. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me. I thought I, I hope I did well. Welcome back. You are listening to 90.5 FM, Big Red Radio. This is the School of Athens, and we're just wrapping up our hour. We'll introduce ourselves again. I am your co-host, Carter Otis. Avik Wadavkar. And Charlie Scales. And today we had Holden Charisma, uh, who unfortunately unfortunately, <laughs> had to leave uh, just before the top of the hour. So we're going to be reviewing some of the wisdom he imparted upon us uh, as relates to Socrates. A lot was laid upon us. Let me yeah, just say that. Yeah. I, I think that was probably the most comprehensive, one of the most comprehensive we've done on this po- on this show. Um, like I said, man, he just knows a lot. <laughs> he knows a lot about that guy and uh, and his influence. I think it was kind of just looking back. I think it, it's important to remember that a lot. He, Socrates wrote nothing down, and that most of what we know, if not all of what we know, comes from Plato and uh, uh, and Xenophon. Is that the other guy? Yeah, yep. sure. uh, those are the two. Xenophon and Plato. So, I mean, you know, I guess there should be a grain of salt taken, but also just the teachings themselves are kind of, they, sp- they speak for themselves, I think, is, is very important to remember. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Holden spoke a bunch to the, the legacy of Socrates, right? Especially at the end, everyone claiming that, you know, he was uh, the creator of their school of thought or, or a, a member of their school of thought. And I think that that's just, you know, as well as, you know, his mystical death and, and like you know, how revered he is today speaks a lot to how important he was just entirely for Western philosophy. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, he's considered, you know, one of the main founding members, if not like the founder of like our modern ethics and our modern Western epistemology, <laughs> right? Um, he's got a progenitor of a lot of these questions. I mean, we don't have much time to get into the specifics of all we went over the podcast. If y'all are interested, uh, please feel free to look up Socrates. As next week, we will not be doing Socrates. Oh, not again! I mean, we could, we could, we could do a double of to do do the do the same one. It's probably a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I know. Too much, too much to condense into one hour. But yeah, so uh, regardless, I don't know. What do y'all think we should do next week? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. I. I don't know. I kind of liked the guest host. I don't know. Yeah, I feel yeah. Like, guest host was interesting. That, yeah. that was definitely cool. You have to find a lot more like knowledgeable people. You know, there are yeah. there are a lot of smart people out there. Plenty, 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 plenty to go find. So yes, um, I we could have we done Buddhism yet? We did do it. Uh, we haven't done Buddhism as of yet, and actually, I'm hoping to get a guest host for Buddhism. Uh, fingers crossed. Drum roll. Uh, if that doesn't happen, if that doesn't happen, then how do y'all feel about some? Existentialism. Oh, Yo. oh, my, my, my favorite, my favorite brand of philosophy. Honestly, not my favorite brand. I'm not gonna lie; they're too cranial for me. I love, <laughs> I love existentialism. Yeah, little, yes, yes. Bring me, bring me boring. some, bring me some Sartre or some, some Kafka or something like that. Oh, uh, we've got, we've got everyone from Nietzsche to, I don't know, who's our modern existentialist? Ah, uh, I have no idea. There are modern people. There like, are they, modern they do people. still talk about yes. it. They didn't they didn't um, solve it way back when. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if anyone's ever solved it. But regardless, uh, we are closing out the hour. This has been School of Athens.